Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this book of this really, as we were saying, interesting prophet. Uh, Lord, thank you for the grace and the mercy that you bestowed on him as well as everybody he seemed to encounter. And thank you most of all for what this teaches us about Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us about these things tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's one of the most famous stories in all the Old Testament. And I would suggest it's also one of the most misunderstood. Uh, the, the account of Jonah, a lot of people look at it as kind of an ancient biblical Hebrew Pinocchio story, but it's not that. You know, not where a poor, misunderstood victim gets trapped in the belly of a whale. Okay, it's not about that. It's not even a morality tale, and some people would look at it that way, you know, where we're warned to do what's right or face the consequences determined by God. Now, there's a little application from that, but that's not really the main point. Um, The account of Jonah is a proclamation of the grand mercy and the grace of God shown not only to an undeserving people, but to an undeserving prophet. And even more than that, uh, the account of Jonah is a grand preview of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's what's most important of all. So in short, this tale of a disobedient prophet really describes for us the gospel, okay? Now, that's not a fish tale, right? That's, that's a great story there. Now, Jonah is a familiar story to most Christians, familiar story to really probably most people in the Western world. And now, i got to warn us, because that brings with us a few benefits, of course, but dangers as well. The benefit, of course, is that this is not new territory for us. Most of us were introduced to this as, you know, with our little Bible storybooks as kids, or at least when we were reading them to kids and that sort of thing. But the danger is the same thing. Because we're so familiar with it, we might miss the main point, right? So we know the broad storyline overall. And because of that, sometimes we miss out on the grace that's found in the detail. So I want us to be careful of that as we dig into it tonight. And of course, we're just doing an overview, so we're just doing a thumbnail sketch of it. But we do, even tonight in a Route 66 study, want to look at Jonah with fresh eyes. Uh, We want to see what God intended to communicate uh, to his people when he originally had it written, of course. Now, just by way of background, technically speaking, the book of Jonah is anonymous. Uh, The narrative is about Jonah, but the author never directly reveals his own identity during the course of the writing. Now, that said, most assume that it is Jonah the prophet who did write this, and he's just writing in the third person after all of these events took place. Now, that really makes the most sense, especially when you consider chapter 2. Jonah writes his own prayer uh, from the belly of the fish, and that, of course, would be impossible for another person to know those things unless it was, you know, the supernatural revelation of God. And That, of course, makes it possible, but the simplest explanation is best, and that's that Jonah is the author. Now, although that very little background information about the prophet is given within the book of Jonah, we actually know a little bit about him from some of the other biblical accounts. Jonah is one of the few minor prophets that are listed outside of his own book. And in fact, 2 Kings chapter 14 says this in verses 23 through 25, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king of Samaria, reigned 41 years, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. Talking about his reign, he restored from the territory of Israel, from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken, who? Through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. There's Jonah right there. That Jonah, the son of Amittai, is confirmed to us in Jonah 1, verse 1. This is the same man, so this is obviously a reference to him. Now, from the account in 2 Kings, this places Jonah uh, chronologically towards the end of the northern kingdom. Okay, so we're looking at about 782 to 753 B.C. He is a citizen of the northern kingdom known as Israel or Samaria by this point. And actually, he did not uh, grow up far, apparently, from the Sea of Galilee. I don't know how well you can see that, but Jonah's really far to the north. There's Gath, Hefer up there, Sea of Galilee. So he was in the far north of the northern kingdom. Now, God apparently spoke through this prophet on more than one occasion, and uh, most likely, of course, using him among the people of Samaria, the northern kingdom, prior to sending him on his mission to the Ninevites. Now, historically speaking, this brings a lot of context to light in regards to his mission. Because what was Nineveh? Nineveh was, at this time, either a principal city or the capital city of Assyria. Who's Assyria? The very nation that God was preparing to use in his discipline of the northern kingdom. 
right? If we're looking at a map of Assyria, its empire, well, Nineveh is way over here, but they had grown, of course, during this time. Their influence was expanding. They're about to come all the way down to Jerusalem and uh, attack that. Of course, they get withheld there. Uh, we read about that with Hezekiah and, and all the rest in uh, Sennacherib. But at this point, they're coming down and they're conquering the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, The Assyrians were known to be a brutal people as they came forth to conquer. They were known for hauling their captives away with fish hooks thrust through their mouths. And you can find little diagrams of this that they found off of reliefs that were carved at different points of times. They worshipped a fish god, half man, half fish. Uh, you actually know the name Dagon. He was also mentioned as being worshipped among the Philistines. And, of course, the Assyrians are far from coastal waters, if you look at where they, uh, their capital city was based. But uh, the fish was highly steamed among them. So we know Jonah... Let's start putting this together. God sent a Samaritan prophet through a fish to go proclaim a message of repentance to a pagan people who worshipped a fish creature, who are the people, or they're the same people that God would use to bring judgment on the people of Samaria, right? So it's no wonder Jonah ran the other way, right? No doubt he's pretty confused at the plan of God. Jonah well understood the growing might of the Assyrian Empire. He knew what was going to happen. If he had paid attention to the messages of the other prophets, which was very likely, he would have known that it was the Assyrians that would bring great destruction upon Israel. And so this isn't a people that Jonah would want to see receive the mercy of God. Of course, we know God would give it. Jonah would personally become a display of the power of Almighty God over the false gods that were worshipped by the Assyrians. Now, interestingly enough, this pagan city of Nineveh would respond far better to the word of God than God's own covenant people. Because although God repeatedly called Israel or Samaria to repent to no avail, Jonah speaks one short message during one brief visit to Nineveh, and the entire city repents. And so the pagans of all people demonstrate the kind of heart humility desired by the Lord, and then kind of show up the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in one sense, even the repentance of Nineveh was yet another confirmation of Israel's own judgment. Because when even the pagans repent, the people of God have no excuse not to do the same thing. Sadly, historically speaking, the repentance of the Ninevites did not last. We're going to read another prophet in a, a few weeks by Nahum. Nahum will later proclaim another message to the people of Nineveh. And in it, God declares that their judgment at that time is certain. But at least this one generation repented. The preaching of the gospel, of course, is never in vain, and even a few, the few who might be saved, are more than worth the effort to go proclaim the gospel to them wherever they might be. Now, I need to address a, just a couple of objections before we get into it. Because of the many fantastic details in the book of Jonah, the stories come under a lot of attack by skeptics, by liberal theologians, and they scoff at the idea of a man being swallowed by a fish, kept alive for three days, and spit back onto the shore has all the trappings of a classic myth, and so they would say it needs to be interpreted as a myth. There are at least two very major problems with that idea. Uh, number one, uh, when God is involved, nothing is impossible. God, by definition, is supernatural. He is super above, beyond nature, beyond all the rules of nature. And if, as the liberals would believe, that any account of the miraculous is to be dismissed as fiction, then there's really nothing left to the Bible, because it's all about God, and God is beyond nature. The truth of the matter, of course, is God is fully capable of doing the miraculous. The proof is in the creation that's all around us. The proof is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The proof is in the, the new birth that we've all received when we came to faith. No serious Christian can truly doubt this miraculous, because without it, we'd have zero salvation. Uh, that's just fundamental to who we are as Christians. Secondly, we have it on the highest of authorities that the account of Jonah is historical, and that testimony com comes from none other than the Lord Jesus himself. On no less than two occasions, Jesus referenced Jonah as being the preeminent sign that pointed to his coming work at the cross and the resurrection. And we read in Matthew 12, 39 through 40, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now we're going to look at this sign a little bit later on uh, in depth, but suffice to say for now that 
if Jesus believed that the events of Jonah were historically accurate, then they are. If Jesus taught it, we ought to believe it. Uh, so let's have those objections just be put aside. As to the book itself, it is rather short. It's only four chapters, and we might quibble a little bit with the placement of the chapter breaks, but the narrative really does break down pretty easily between them. You might uh, label chapter one the flight when he runs away from God, runs away from the mission that God gave him. We have the fish, of course, where he uh, takes the first submarine ride in history. We have uh, the city where he actually goes and preaches to Nineveh, and then the aftermath that follows from that point. Okay, and that's just a brief outline overview. Let's get into it. The flight. This is by far, by the way, the most famous section out of the book of Jonah. It demonstrates how uh, you know, the prophet ran from God and the surprising complacency that Jonah demonstrates towards his calling, demonstrates really towards the people that are all around him. We start off with some background in verses 1 through 3. God calls to him, and Jonah responds. And this is God's first call to Jonah. We'll see a second one later on. Jonah, of course, as we mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, is confirmed to be the son of Amittai, that same prophet listed in 2 Kings 14. But most importantly, what we see here is that the call of God is clearly given to him. There's no doubt what God has commissioned him to do. Look at verse 2, where it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Let's paraphrase that a little bit. It basically says, Get up and get going to a people you hate, and go tell them about me. Now, most people, we would say if we were asked, uh, sure, I want to obey God. If we're given the choice, we'd rather obey God than disobey God. But not too many would want to obey a command like that. How many of us are really willing to go, where many missionaries do go, but willing to go to a people who hate us and want to see us dead and then go tell them the gospel of Jesus? Now, we know that God wants Arabs saved just like he wants Americans saved. God wants the gospel to go to the non-believer in the Bible belt just as much as he does to the Muslim in the Middle East. Now, obviously, that's a very specific calling. God equips those whom he calls. But when God calls, we ought to obey. When it's clear instruction, we need to clearly follow. The problem for us many times is we don't follow the clear instruction of the Word of God. Now, just leave cross-cultural missions aside for a moment because God hasn't called many of us to go to the Middle East and go preach to them. But look at the commands to just, you know, love our neighbors as ourselves, love our enemies as ourselves. So the command to, you know, forgive others who have sinned against us. How many times? Up to 70 times 7, innumerable amount of times. And how quick are we to obey those commands? You know, there are some times where we sometimes wonder, you know, what, what is the will of God for me in this life? But there's other times that his will is crystal clear, and we ought to obey. And even when it's not crystal clear, we ought to still obey, trusting that God's going to guide us along the way as time goes on. Of course, Jonah does not obey. Instead, this, you know, great man of God, this prophet who was already used mightily by the Lord, he turns tail and he runs the other direction. In fact, he planned to go as far as he could to get away from the command of God. The Bible tells us here that Jonah went to Joppa. Joppa is a port city, and he gets a ticket on a boat going to Tarshish. You say, how far away is that? Well, in Jonah's mind, that was the opposite end of the earth. Let's go as far away as I could possibly get, as far as my maps show me that I can go. Now, as bad as all of that looks, it's really a lot worse <laughs> than that. The Jews were famously fearful of the sea. There's a reason why so many of the Psalms speak about being covered over by the deep. Why only one king, Solomon, out of all the kings, only one king is ever listed to have, to have built a navy or ships of any kind. Now, they, they were on the Sea of Galilee and there were fishermen there, but they never went into the deep. For being a coastal people, and of course, Israel's right on the course, they spent very, very little time offshore. And yet, where did Jonah go? He went to the open water. His hesitancy to disobey God was, you know, far greater than his fear of the sea. He'd rather go into the sea than go obey God here. And so Jonah gets on a boat, trying in vain, as it says in verse 3, to flee from the presence of the Lord. Sometimes we sin out of neglect. Sometimes our sin just sneaks up on us. Then there's times that we actively plan it out and we scheme just how far we can rebel against God and still get away with it. And that was one of those times for Jonah. We ought to beware of that because times like that inevitably come with dire consequences. When those th thoughts start running through your head, that's some time to spend some serious time on your knees in prayer, humbling yourself before God. All right, so 
from that point, of course, we actually we have the uh, background, and then we actually get the storm. First thing, actually, we see in this is Jonah's complacency. Along, along the way, of course, he's on the ship. This massive storm comes out of nowhere. Things are so bad that it seems like the ship is about to fall apart, as we see in verse 4. And what's Jonah's reaction? Well, Jonah is fast asleep. He has no reaction whatsoever because he's down in the bowels of the ship, somehow able to sleep through all of this mess. Verse 5 tells us that. Most of us would be hanging on for dear life, probably trying to keep our lunch down. Jonah, he's sleeping like a babe. Everybody else on the ship, they're panicking. They're crying out to whatever god he worshipped. Jonah doesn't have a care in the world. What happened? Well, his determined sin made his heart hard, and now he's become completely complacent to all the people to all the circumstances around him. And oftentimes, isn't that a part of our sin? We're so caught up in what we want to do that we don't care about anything else going on around us. We don't care about any of the people going around us. We just want our lust at that moment satisfied, whatever it is. Of course, the captain comes to Jonah and has to shame this prophet into praying. Think about that for a moment, you great man of God. Why aren't you praying to anybody? And then Jonah still doesn't say anything Surely he knew at this moment that it was God working towards him, and yet he remains silent. He's allowing everybody else to panic in the meantime and bear his consequences for him. Finally, they cast lots, trying to figure out what's going on. Jonah's found out, and then he proclaims his faith in God. What a great testimony. Verse 9, so he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, what's the problem here? Jonah said it, but his actions denied it. He fears the Lord. He claimed to fear the Lord God, the Yahweh, the I Am, the ever-existent, almighty God, covenant-keeping God of Israel. But he's not acting like it. He claims to fear the Lord who made the sea that's now roiling beneath them, yet he did nothing. His testimony is just shot apart by his sin and his apathy. Have you ever found yourself in a similar situation where you finally admitted you're a Christian and the people around you say, really? I couldn't tell. Thankfully, God will forgive us when we confess our sins. You know, certainly God can save the lost with or without our obedience, and we're going to find that to be the case with the sailors here, but it's far better to be used by the Lord as a good example rather than as a poor one. Jonah's a very poor example here. Uh, He does, of course, tell them what's going on eventually. The Jonas call Jonah, uh, excuse me, the sailors call out Jonah on his disobedience. They knew, it says in verse 11, that he had fled from the Lord, And so they ask him what he's going to do to fix this. You know, this is his fault. He ought to know how to make it right again. Now, with the sea getting worse and worse and worse, there's no time to waste. Jonah, of course, did know the solution, but it wasn't one that would sound like it would come from a person who's in his right mind. Look at verse 12. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Now, of course, we know the story, so this almost seems logical to us, of course. You know, just throw him to God, and God will take care of him. But we need to think about this from the perspective of the pagan sailors at the time who didn't know what was going to happen. So this prophet of God just told them that the only way to appease God is to personally pick up the prophet, cast him overboard, and leave him to drown in the sea. Now, I've got to ask a question why Jonah didn't think to just step out of the boat at this point. I have no idea. But maybe this is exactly what God was wanting to use for the sailors to come to faith. But to the sailors, this would have sounded like madness. This would have sounded like a plan. Let's just make God even angrier than he already is by killing his prophet. So it's no wonder that they didn't want to follow through. This isn't, uh, you know, willing to disobey. This is fear of the Lord here. Of course, it was the truth, and they struggle against this word of God. They finally surrender to it, and they pray that God would forgive them for any sin. They cast Jonah overboard, and what happens? Instant peace, instant calm. Just like when Jesus calmed the storm, it was instant. Same thing here. Now, that would have made an impact on them for sure. And did please note that they came to faith. Look at verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. You know, that's not language you use to describe a group of pagan sailors. This is a description of people who now, if not before, who now worshipped the living God. And it's easy to see why, because even here we get a glimpse of the gospel. We think about it. God's anger is being poured out on all. And then when God's chosen man is seemingly put to death, God's anger is appeased and people come to faith. That's what took place at the cross, right? Right? 
Now, obviously, in that case, the, the direction of God's anger was different. There it was rightly, directly uh, directed against us because we had earned our, uh, our sin, our, our, our punishment for sin. Whereas in Jonah's case, it was directed at Jonah. But when God's chosen servant took our punishment, he stepped in our place. When he took the wrath of God upon himself, then we experienced peace and tranquility with God. Only then was it able for us to come to faith and worship him rightly. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. That's the definition of the big biblical word, propitiation. He satisfied God's anger on our behalf. So amen for that. Okay, so there's the flight. Now we move to the fish. Uh, Jonah's going to be humbled by God. Now, I would quibble a little bit with the, um, the chapter break here. and It's really the very end of chapter 1. I think should go with chapter 2. Editors probably let it out because uh, the narrative, the genre changes a little bit. Uh, 1 was narrative, and chapter 2 is primarily going to be poetry or a psalm. But in any case, this is God's provision for Jonah. You might notice in verse 17 it says, Well, ahead of the time God prepared a great fish for Jonah where he remained three days and three nights, and again, he received a a submarine ride. Now, as to what fish this was that swallowed Jonah, that's what everybody asks, but let's be honest, we don't know. Obviously, the ancient Hebrews didn't have the same biological, zoological classification that we have today. There are all kinds of sea animals that they would have considered fish that we might put in different categories. Uh, A lot of people would say, well, a whale swallowed Jonah. Well, it doesn't seem probably likely that a whale did, certainly possible for the God who works the impossible, but the whales who are capable of such a thing aren't generally in those waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Sharks, however, sharks are another story, and great whites could conceivably swallow a man whole if the great white was large enough. Plus, as I was reading on this today, I can't claim to have known this beforehand, but the digestive system in a shark works far slower than in mammals such as whales which would make sense for three days and three nights, right? Great whites are found in coastal waters, including the Mediterranean Sea. Just this year, by the way, if we question the size, April 2015, the largest great white ever recorded on film was found. I don't know how well you can see that. That's a picture of one that they called uh, Deep Blue. He's 20 feet long. Scientists believe him to be, believe her rather, to be 50 years old and pregnant at that time. Love the fact they're going to be having more. (laughs) But something of that size obviously could have easily swallowed a man as Jonah. Now, we don't know that for sure, of course. Keep in mind, though, even with an animal large enough that we would find naturally in the waters today, none of this takes away from the supernatural miracle it was to keep Jonah alive. Not only did whatever creature this was capture Jonah at precisely the right time, not only did the sea stop roiling at that moment, but Jonah was neither crushed, he wasn't digested, he wasn't even suffocated during the three days and three nights he was in the belly of this great fish. So by any definition, this is still a miracle that's going on. And again, one other thing, I don't want you to miss the point that God prepared all of this in advance. God knew Jonah was going to sin, and he prepared this creature long ago, causing it to grow larger and larger and larger year after year until what the time was right. And God brought the creature to the precise place Jonah would need to fall. God God even provided all the means necessary to keep Jonah alive that entire time. Now keep in mind, the whole reason Jonah needed this was due to his sin, and God even made provision for Jonah in the midst of that. That is grace. So from that point, of course, God provides, but Jonah prays. First thing he does is he cries out to God. For the first time in the book, Jonah is shown praying to God. Now, there's no objection recorded when he runs from God's command. There's no argument with God. There's no question, why God? Why? There's just simple disobedience at that time. But here, Jonah cries out in faith. He understands it was the Lord who brought him to this place and even trusts that God would answer him. And it says that much in verse 1. He describes the pit that he's in. You might notice how he describes it. He says in verse 2b, latter half, it says the belly of Sheol. Right? That's common terminology for the grave. From Jonah's perspective, he's as good as dead. This was just like being buried like any other corpse. He describes his watery circumstances in verse 3 and verse 5. He's also looking forward in faith. 
because he trusted, and one day he's once again going to see the holy temple of God, verse 4. He knew that God would once more bring his life up from the pit, verse 6. Guys, this is language of death and resurrection. It's no wonder that Jesus referred to this as the singular sign of the Messiah because this is exactly what Jesus himself would endure. Jesus would be buried. He'd come up from the pit. What Jonah wrote in the midst of his discipline is what Jesus would later affirm in the midst of his obedience. Wonderful bit of gospel irony there. It goes on in his prayer to describe his renewal of faith. Although it would have been very easy for Jonah to despair in the fish stomach, and who among us wouldn't? He continually prayed to the Lord God, and he affirmed even the basic character of God as being that of mercy, verse 8. Others could pray to other idols if they want, but they'd be forsaking their only hope, their only mercy. Mercy can only be found in the one true God. Salvation, verse 9, is only of him. And Jonah trusted that he'd one day be able to offer sacrifices to God again. Now, chapter 1 showed Jonah to be a man of very, very little faith. Chapter 2 shows Jonah to be a man of great faith. And what is it that made the difference between these things? If anything else, it could have been in Jonah's life. It was the discipline of God. It was when Jonah was allowed to endure the consequences of his sin that he finally turned back to the Lord and trusted in God's good work. That is the point of God's discipline. When it comes to his children, God never disciplines us for the joy of punishment. He disciplines us because he loves us and he wants us to be restored back to him. As long as he lets us walk around in our sin like an unbeliever, our hearts are going to remain far from him. But when he convicts us by his spirit, when he pierces us with his word, when he disciplines us through all sorts of various consequences that he allows to come into our life, that's when what we experience a godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. That's when our hearts are humbled and we once again seek the Lord in faith. Now, nobody wants to experience the discipline of God, but through it, our faith can be increased by leaps and bounds. And that's what happened here with Jonah. So you might recall God's first provision for him was the fish. There was a second provision for him as well. We see in verse 10, uh, first was to be swallowed by the fish. The second was to be vomited by the fish. It may sound gross, but that's still grace. Because after all, God could have let Jonah remain there. God could have let the fish spit him out in the deep. Instead, God took him to the place that he wanted him to be on the shore, and he cast him there. Plus, there's just grace in giving Jonah another chance. God wasn't done with his prophet, and he basically puts him back on the starting line and begins all over again. All right, chapter 3 takes us to the city. Uh, God does call, and Jonah has a second response here as chapter 3 begins. Regarding that second chance, it was basically just that. God virtually says the same thing that he said back in chapter 1. Look at verse 2 of chapter 3. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Preach to it the message that I tell you. There are a few differences here from chapter 1. God doesn't detail the wickedness of Nineveh. And here God tells uh, Jonah um, that he's going to tell Jonah what to say later on. He doesn't give him the message right here immediately. But even so, the basic intent is the same. Get up and get going. Grace is found in the second chance, right? Did Jonah take it? Yes, he did this time. This time he obeyed. Now, it would have taken him some time to travel to, to Nineveh, but he was faithful to make the journey. Apparently, God gave Jonah the message along the way. And by the time he gets to Nineveh, Jonah preaches the shortest revival sermon in history. Verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Our teachings last 45 minutes. His lasted four seconds. Was that all Jonah said? We don't know. Certainly possible that uh, Jonah said more, even though this was the only thing recorded. But that said, even if this was all that Jonah preached, it was enough. It was the declaration of God's judgment. And then Jonah's very appearance would have given credibility to his words. Because here's a man who had been in the belly of a great fish. And he had the scars to prove it. His skin would have been bleached by stomach acid. Uh, who knows for how long that stench would have been on him. And for a people who worshipped a fish god to encounter a prophet who had a, a story like this, that would have gained a lot of attention. Now you look at that message that he preached there, 40 days and yet Nineveh shall be overthrown. Is this really enough of a message to preach the gospel? And the answer to that question is yes. Jonah spoke the bad news, 
and his life demonstrated the good news. The bad news is that all their sin was known before God and the God of Israel had all the power that was necessary to overthrow their city and utterly destroy them. He was a God of all creation, even over the fish God of the sea and whatnot. His wrath was aroused. God was mighty. That's the bad news. The good news is that he's a merciful God, that gracious God. He even brought up his disobedient prophet from the virtual grave. And if he'd show grace to a person like that, certainly he might show grace to others. That's the same sort of message that we share when we tell others of Jesus. The bad news is we've all sinned against God, and God knows that no matter what our particular sin is, we deserve his wrath, and he has the power to give it. But the good news is that he's a merciful God, the gracious God, who brought up his son from the dead after Jesus died in our place. And if God can save somebody like me through Jesus Christ, surely he'd save somebody like you. That's exactly his promise, and that's what we share when we tell of Jesus Christ. And so the message is preached, and what happens? Well, Nineveh repents, and God relents. Whether he preached once or many times over the course of his time there, the people heard his message and responded. And starting with the king and proceeding all the way down to the pauper, every single person in the city humbled himself, fasted, and prayed mightily to God, hoping for the potential of mercy. The people who had never, ever known the true God in the past now turned to him in hopefulness, and God responded. Look at verse 10. He relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. God showed himself to be the merciful God that he is. Guys, never hesitate to be humble. Never resist true repentance. Obviously, the Bible isn't advocating you just go through the motions of humility. He's talking here about something that's truly sincere. God sees the sincere, humble heart. God sees those who turn to him in true faith. And it may be too late to avoid certain temporary consequences, but it's never too late to humble ourselves before Almighty God. As long as we have breath, we can still repent and put our trust in him. So that's what happened in Nineveh in the city. And then there's the aftermath starting in chapter 4. Jonah gets angry at God. He starts complaining. Jonah just saw the greatest evangelical revival in history. He had a 100% conversion rate. And how does he respond to his success? He pouts. He becomes displeased and angry, verse 1. All along, he knew God to be a merciful God, but the problem is he didn't want God to be merciful this time. He would have welcomed God's mercy upon the Israelites, the Samaritans, but not on the Ninevites. God wanted this enemy of Israel to be destroyed, not prolonged. So what does he do? Jonah actually compares, uh, complains rather about the character of God. Look at verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. You know, we hear a lot of complaints about God from skeptics today, but how many times have you heard a complaint about God's loving kindness and his mercy? Usually people complain about God being judgmental, not merciful. Of course, the modern skeptics are just as wrong as Jonah was. He isn't too anything. He's not too judgmental, not too... No, he's just perfect. His character is righteous. It's just in every aspect. But that said, has there ever been someone you haven't wanted to see saved? Is there anyone, you know, besides Satan that you'd be absolutely fine with if they ended up in eternal hell? I know what the church answer is, but if we're being honest, we probably all think of somebody. We've got to be careful because we're no less deserving of hell than the worst of the mass murderers in history. We may have committed less grievous sins, but we still sin. The wages of sin is death. And if we've broken the law in one point, we're guilty of the whole thing. And guess what? We're guilty. And if we were shown grace, then we, wanna, uh, we ought to want others, even our worst enemies, to experience that, that same grace. That's got to be part of what it means to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, which is exactly what Jesus told us to do. As for Jonah... Jonah's so upset by this that he prays to die. Now remember when he was back in the fish? He couldn't wait to once again offer sacrifices to God and pay his vows to God. But in light of God's mercy that he showed to Nineveh, well, those promises right out the window. He'd rather die. He throws a first-class temper tantrum. God calls him on it, actually. In fact, he's going to give him a visual parable to show how ridiculous it all is. And that's where this plant comes in. Jonah leaves the city, and he heads off into the outskirts of it, the wilderness right outside. And he thinks that maybe, you know, God's going to relent from the relenting and actually decide to destroy Nineveh after all. And so he makes himself this crude shelter, decides to wait it out. 
Now, what does God do in the meantime? Well, God prepared a plant, just like he had prepared a great fish. God does a lot of preparing here. He knows what was going to happen. And he prepares this plant to grow into this, uh, such a size that would provide shade for him. We see that in verse 6. So one day the plant rises up. Jonah's grateful. The next day God prepared something else. He prepared a worm, verse 7, and the shade was gone. The weather gets worse. Jonah's miserable, and again he wishes to die. Now keep in mind, he's right outside of a major city. He could have gone in at any time for food, shelter, or water, or whatever. This is jo- Jonah in all of his stubbornness outside. Oh, so that's when God really calls him to the carpet. And we see the pity of God versus the apathy, really, of Jonah, the pity of Jonah, which is none. God speaks up to Jonah once more, telling him basically the same thing that he had asked him about the mercy that was shown to, to Nineveh. Is it right to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry about uh, my mercy? Is it right for you to be angry about this plant? Verse 9. These were things that God did. Did Jonah have the right to be angry about any of it? When it's God who's working, God who makes the decision, was it Jonah's place to cast judgment of God and be angry at what God had done? And incredibly, Jonah has the gall to answer yes. He says, even unto death, verse 9. He's so arrogant by this point, the prophet is, he believes he can cast judgment on God and his ways. And that's a point we all got to beware. Then God goes on to point out Jonah's lunacy in it all. The prophet had more compassion on a plant than he did on people. He cared more about a weed than we ones, children, right? Who would have been destroyed. Jonah could have at least cared about the animals in the city, and he takes no thought even of them. Jonah was just as selfish outside the city as he had been on the ship in the middle of the storm. It doesn't matter who dies as long as I get my way. And guess what? That's how the story ends. There's no happily ever after, not even for Nineveh, because remember, they're the ones that are going to be going on to be judged by God when they go back to their evil ways, and Nahum's going to fill us in on what happens there. After a brief period of time, of course, they repented. That pleased God, but that ticked off God's prophet. Jonah had been reluctant to obey the first time, and despite a sincere display of faith that in the middle, he still throws a fit at the end. So what's the deal? What's the point of including a story like this in the Bible anyway? It seems so pointless. The deal was is that this may have been the end for Jonah, but that's not the end of his story. See, you actually have to wait till the New Testament for that. And I want to put on one thing here, which is the postscript, the sign. The whole occasion of Jonah may have remained just a weird footnote among the Old Testament prophets if it had not been for one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Certainly, of course, we saw throughout Jonah the power and the mercy of God on display. We saw them in the lives of Jonah, the sailors, and the people of Nineveh. But there was a greater thing that God was even doing through Jonah's disobedience. God was providing the ultimate confirming sign of his son. And we mentioned this earlier. Jesus specifically referred to that. When he was challenged by the Pharisees and the scribe to provide a sign, tell us why, give us a sign that you've got the right to teach the things that you teach. Give us a sign that says you've got the right to do the things that you're doing. And Jesus answered with the scripture that we quoted earlier. Let's read it again, Matthew 9, 12 through, uh, Matthew 12, rather, 39 and 40. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This weird, disobedient, arrogant prophet did something that was so incredible that nothing in the history of the world had ever been like it and none would ever take place again except for one time and that was to provide that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God how is it that Jesus would prove all of his teachings were true how is it that Jesus would prove his identity that he is who he said he was a son of God by what by giving the sign of the prophet Jonah by rising from the dead after three days For Jonah to go into the fish was for Jonah to die. Now, whether or not he literally died there, and scholars debate that, no one knows. What we do know is that Jonah felt as if he was dead. Remember, he said he was in Sheol, the grave. Now, to the Pharisees, Jesus declared that he would do the same thing, but it wouldn't be the belly of a fish. It would be the heart of the earth. He would be literally buried for three days and rise again, and that's exactly what he did. The sign of the prophet Jonah is the sign of the resurrection The sign of the resurrection is a proof that Jesus is the Son of God. And as we've seen so many times from Romans 1, 3, and 4, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
He was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How so? By the resurrection from the dead. We can trust that Jesus is who he says he is because Jesus said, because he did what he said he would do, and that was rise from the grave. Our faith in Jesus Christ is based on the sign of the prophet Jonah, and that is the most significant aspect of the entire book. You know, just to wrap it up, some biblical characters are great examples of what to do. Others show what not to do. More often than not, Jonah's the latter. He's initially disobedient, running the other way, completely selfish, complacent about the lives of others, not a role model, right? We'd hold up to others. At one point, he humbles himself, trusting God, follows her in obedience. Sadly, he goes right back to his old ways. But the good news in the book of Jonah isn't Jonah. The good news in Jonah is God. Because through it all, God was merciful. He was merciful to the pagan sailors who never otherwise would have worshipped the God who created the seas. He was merciful to the city of Nineveh who never otherwise would have humbled themselves before the God of all the universe was far more powerful than their false God that they worshipped. He was even merciful to Jonah, a prophet who deserved utter judgment for his disobedience, flagrant disobedience. People had died for far less, but he received grace even after he wasn't willing to extend it to others. Our God is the all-powerful God, to be sure, but he's also the merciful God, and we are the recipients of that same mercy and grace. There's the good news. The good news is also, of course, in the resurrection. Jonah's disobedience gave a platform for the thing upon which our very faith hinges, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That is the ultimate sign of the Son of God, and should we doubt everything else, and doubts are going to come Uh, every so often. We never need doubt the resurrection of Christ, and that provides the foundation for everything else. So don't you love it? One of the worst prophets in the Old Testament paved the way for the greatest act in all history, the resurrection, and for that we can be thankful. So as we close, I want to ask, have us all ask ourselves, you know, are there times, are we maybe right now being disobedient to God? God's told us to do something. We know what his word says, and we've been running the other way. Maybe we're at a point where we're actively trusting the mercies of God, and hopefully we always are. Maybe we need to reaffirm that trust. Most importantly is our trust, our faith, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he did rise exactly as he said he would do, according to the model that he said he would do it. Let's pray. Father, So thank you so much for uh, Jonah. Thank you, Lord, how... You use his act of disobedience uh, to give the sign for the greatest act in all history. We are saved because Jesus rose from the dead. All that pictured because a disobedient prophet ran from you and be risen from a fish. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us truly be assured in our faith because of the resurrection of Jesus. That as doubts come and go, uh, we can rest on that bedrock historical truth. Father, I also pray that you would help us uh, walk after you in obedience, that we wouldn't run. Uh, Our first reaction would not be to run away from your commands, Lord, but to humble ourselves before you and completely depend on you. Uh, doing the things that you've called us to do, trusting that you're going to do the right thing. Help us have compassion uh, towards those whom we would otherwise hate. Have our hearts be transformed to where we would see them as you see them, Lord. Uh, Lost souls in need of the gospel to be saved. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done for us in Jesus Christ and for all the ways that when we have sinned, and we all have sinned like Jonah at some point, that we can find forgiveness through what Jesus has done for us in the cross and the resurrection. And we have hope in him. Lord, we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.